Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Please be seated. The final verse of this passage in the Gospels. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the first of the verses then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, we could mistake, we, well, we could make a big mistake if we think that somehow Jesus is here and the Spirit somehow came to Jesus in a way that God the Father is over here and God the Son's over there and God the Holy Spirit is over here. No, 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 no. All three at once together. That's the Trinity. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I just know it is. I accept that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the Godhead. So in this passage I read, Jesus is filled with the Spirit. Have you ever been around people and you notice you're at a party and they've had too much? They've been filled with too much alcohol and their disposition changes. They're either flatline and they need to just take a pillow and go to sleep or they are dancing wildly all over the place or they are expressing what went in because it's coming out caught that one all right so filled with the spirits a person changes if i eat the wrong foods my belly hurts and if my belly hurts it affects my mind and my whole disposition, my whole behavior, my whole mood changes. Jesus filled with the Spirit. Do you ever go to a congregation and you see people that are filled with the Spirit? Do you ever go to a place where you see someone that you just know they are a holy person? You are in the presence of holy. You are in the presence of someone who loves the Lord. Do you ever go to a church where you have no idea? You don't know if you're in a worship service, worshiping and praising God, or if you're at a funeral. How many times have I said to someone playfully, but seriously, are you happy? Yes? Would you mind informing your face? Because it conceals what's inside, if it's truly inside. I don't bounce around on Sunday mornings, most Sunday mornings, because of the coffee that I drink. I bounce around because I am privileged. I'm the only person in this congregation that gets or hopes to get undivided attention. And I know that what I say is going to have an impact. It's going to influence positively or negatively. I know that as a messenger, I am going to get shot at times. And I know that here, the message that I try to bring to you is, there is only one name that I really want you to know, and that's the name of Jesus. And in this passage, I think we see a Jesus that's connected to the lesson before it and connected to the lesson before it. It certainly connects with 1 Corinthians 12, all the members of the body, and it clearly states those of a lower status, those of a lower income, those in greater need, those who are oppressed, those who are blind physically and spiritually and mentally and emotionally, psychologically, those who are 
captive. And it clearly states, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to do what? To bring good news, not to the rich, but to the poor. The Spirit has anointed me, and he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Notice it doesn't say, sent me to release the captives. To proclaim release to the captives. To pronounce it. To declare it. To make sure that someone knows you are free. You are blessed. You don't have to live in the bondage of whatever sin you are living in. And I know society has standards, and society standards change, they shift all the time. What was once forbidden is now accepted. What is forbidden now will likely be accepted down the road. It's for us to contemplate, to study the Word of God, to pray, and to have holy conversation. I have an invitation extended to most of the men in the congregation to join a group that I'm going to call the Old Guys and Pastor Bob. Old farts and Pastor Bob. I don't care what we call it, but I know that most of you are older than I am, and I'm inviting you to participate in a God's Word Blesses Us experience. I think you'll experience it as something almost, almost too soft, almost without impact. Yeah, I can walk down where I live. We have paths that walk around the golf course. It's this little kind of chip and putt golf course that I think is comical. Uh, but if you walk along the paths, you go down to the ponds, and that's where I go to visit my ducks. That's where I go to see the mallards and the wood ducks, and I go there to see the geese periodically, and I don't like geese, but I do. And I go there to experience God's creation. I can't do that in my home nearly as well as when I'm out in the field, when I feel the breeze and I listen to the bluebird and I watch the cardinal and I find my ducks. They make me happy. In fact, they make me quack up. I love ducks. They bring joy. I am filled with joy when I see God's creation. I am filled with joy when I see God's creation, you. And in the third chapter of Galatians, I've asked you to turn there, so if you haven't gone there, it's in the back of your Bibles, and again, the Gospels, and then Acts, and Romans, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and God eats popcorn. And if you go to that third chapter, you'll probably find it on page 947 if you're a page seeker rather than a scripture looker. On 947, in the 26th verse, if you found it, raise your hand. The third chapter of Galatians. Good. For in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. In my family, Kelly and I are related because of biology. My sister and I are related because of biology. But we went one step further. We decided to love each other, not just because we are family. We made a commitment to caring for each other because we are brother and sister. And I listened to my sister. I listened to her because she is wise and she is bright and she is insightful. And she is far more humorous than I am. True? You don't know about that. All right. I think she's more colorful than I am. We are one. We are one. So as many of you, as many of you, as were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Melissa, I don't know if you remember Almost four years ago, you were standing up here in the old chancel area, and I tried to show the congregation experiential learning. I tried to use a visual. I took, I pretended that I was Jesus. And of course I am, because at one point I did have blonde hair and blue eyes, so you know, I'm Jesus. So that's funny. So I took my robe off, and I clothed you in my nature, 
my robe is righteousness, and I clothed this one in righteousness. If we see each other as clothed in righteousness, we will treat each other differently. We are kind to each other, are we not? At St. John's, we are nice to each other, aren't we? Are we also truthful? Are we honest? Do we lead with that as our hallmark? Will we listen to the difficult things and not just the easy things? I have been told, don't talk about politics from the pulpit. Yet it's the one place where we should talk about politics, I think. And this passage, I'm leading us right into it, I hope, and get your guns out. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. There is no longer Democrat or Republican. There is no longer, there's no longer so much of how we treat each other as we approach one another. As I approach Nyla, I see a young woman. As I approach Nyla, Nyla, do you mind? I know you probably don't like this, but would you please stand up? This is Nyla. She's our almost 15-year-old. As I, you know, I, I, when I see Nyla, I don't see male or female. I don't see Jew or Greek. I don't see, I see one in Christ with me. I see a younger sister in the faith. That's what I choose to see. Now, I could see a little kid. I could see kind of cute glasses. Not kind of, really cute glasses. So I could see the one who didn't really want me to sing karaoke Friday night. I could see that, but I don't. I choose to see my sister in Christ. I choose to see her clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I choose to see you as one who is baptized. Not just one that had water spritzed in her head, but one in baptism who is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. So I see a child of God. It's my choice. I see a child of God when I hear about the opioid crisis in my town. I hear about an opioid crisis when I know that the ambulance associations are saying that we have 10 per week, and that's just one ambulance group. So we have that in our presence. I don't choose to see some are addicts and some are not. I choose to see that some have empty bellies, and I choose to do something about it. I choose to see where people are flawed and frail and foibled, and they have their sins. Sometimes they are secret, and sometimes they are revealed. Sometimes they are private, and sometimes they are exposed to the detriment and breakdown of all kinds of systems. But I choose, I choose, because of this passage, I choose to be one in Christ. And if I belong to Christ, then I now go back and affirm the whole Old Testament when I understand myself as one of Abraham's offspring. When God said, I will give you as many descendants as you see and count stars in the heavens. And, Mo and Abraham said, they are, I can't count them all. So my black sisters and brothers and my brown sisters and brothers, it is not about hashtag Black Lives Matter to the exclusion of everyone else. That's not what anyone in that movement, I can't imagine, would believe. And my explanation of it is, when the fire company goes to a home that's set ablaze, it cares about the residents, and it cares about that particular home. Not to the exclusion of every other home in the community, but that particular home needs particular care at that particular moment. So maybe Black Lives Matter is because now's the time that those particular lives need some attention. And maybe in our community, it's the drug addicts that are caught with opioids. And guess what? It's not the lower class. Guess who has access to opioids? We all do. I think it's amazing. It's amazing that God would say, be one. 
I think it's powerful that in our lesson today in the, in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians, that God sets his order. That, that God, but God has so arranged the body. We're the body. We think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect, whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member. Isn't that why you hired me? Not to go hang out and cater to the people who have the money in the congregation so that they put more in the plate? Didn't you hire me to take care of? Didn't you call me to take care of those in greatest need? Didn't you call me to set captives free or at least to proclaim that? Isn't that why we're here? I think so. So are we a congregation? Ooh, forgot these different glasses. Anyway, aren't we a congregation that should express the spirit is alive in us? I want our sign to say St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church, not St. John's Funeral Home. I want our sign to proclaim to all the community what we do. We feed the hungry. We proclaim captive. We set people free. We restore sight to the blind. That's worth staying in ministry. That's worth being a part of this community. I thank God that the size of our congregation has gotten a little smaller because now it's right in front of us, right? We can't, we can't mistake the empty pews. We know they're empty. And if everybody in Boyertown went to church, we don't have enough churches in Boyertown to actually service everybody in Boyertown. And someone's going to say, oh, but you're not going to get anybody. I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. I believe. And when I don't, I go to some of you and sometimes I find encouragement and sometimes I find confirmation that it's not worthwhile. But it doesn't take long to know that we are one body. But I get that not because I go to you, but I get that because I go to the word of God. You're not my source. This is my source. You're people with whom I should work and live and do things together. But I find my salvation in you. My salvation is in Jesus Christ. And I am convinced that the Holy Spirit is present here. And I am convinced that people that say they're happy whose faces don't, I am convinced that at some point we'll see their teeth and they will smile. I am convinced that in Boyertown we will address the opioid crisis. I am convinced that we will feed the hungry. I'm convicted to not stop. And someday, Nyla, I am going to sing karaoke. And then some pest control company is going to hire me because all the rats and mice will run away. I try to be good at declaration. I try to declare things as properly as I can. I try to, to preach the promise that God offers us. And I hope that what you hear is an invitation. I hope that you hear the invitation. I can tell you that the words I say, especially for those viewing on television, my words are either being affirmed by the people they see behind me, or they are not being affirmed by the people they see behind me. Because my words are either going to have smiles back here or intensity and looking at the Bible, or their faces are going to communicate to the world. Their faces, not mine. So it is up to you if you want St. John's to have a life that's filled with the Spirit. Not me. Not I. It's up to you if those mouths are going to be fed. My annual report, I'm the last one to submit. And boy, I don't want to go through the statistics. You know what I want to say? Here's my annual report. And you know what, Becky, this is my annual report. I'm doing the best I can. Are you? Be blessed. That's going to be my, that is my annual report. Amen.